I'm kind of embarrassed to admit it, but I'm not quite sure why I chose Jonah to be our companion for the journey for my three-week preaching assignment this summer. I've never really studied Jonah in depth, but there was something that kind of attracted me to this guy, and I've come to love him. <laughs> he's raw, he's real, and he's a rebel. Truth to tell, I'm kind of a rebel too. <laughs> I have never followed the crowd. I do not follow fads of fashion. You can probably figure that out quickly. <laughs> <clears throat> In fact, as a teenager, when hair was long, mine was short, and when hair was short, mine was long. And as an adult, when a word falls into overuse, I stop using it. Like the words these days, passion and engage, I don't use them anymore. I rebel. I think my theme song might be, I want to be me. <laughs> I'm a rebel. And that's why I think I'm attracted to Jonah. Rebels unite. <laughs> I have read a lot of books lately about Jonah. It dawned on me just this past week that the book I like the best was written by a rebel. In fact, a rebel that I know personally. I got to know him when he was in high school and I was his youth pastor many, many years ago. Brian Estelle, as a teenager, bright, fun-loving, and a rebel. I can assure you, he gave his wonderful parents many a sleep-deprived and prayer-filled nights. <laughs> we all wondered if he'd finish high school. Well, he did, and then commenced to drift on a fishing boat up in Alaska, a backcountry guide in the Sierras drifting, until Jesus Christ got a hold of him big time. Turned him around. He went to college and excelled, which didn't really surprise me. And then after college, he decided that Jesus was calling him in to vocational ministry to be a pastor. Brian Estelle, that did surprise me. He went to seminary and excelled, got out, discovered a gift of evangelism, and planted several churches. What a surprise. And then he decided God was calling him to go back to graduate school, to a big-name school back east, and get a Ph.D. in Hebrew. <laughs> and now he's teaching Hebrew and Old Testament at a seminary. Who would have believed it? Certainly not I. Now, my wife, my wife could see it in him. I could not. Guess what was the first book that Brian Estelle published? It was about... Jonah, <laughs> Rebels Unite. <laughs> and it's a great book because Brian, with his expertise on Hebrew language and literature and Hebrew culture, brings out in that book all kinds of fascinating nuances and colors and even humor that I didn't get reading it in English. I'm going to pass along some of those great insights as we go along this morning. <clears throat> I'm a rebel. He's a rebel. Rebels Unite. Maybe that's why I love Jonah. It's my story. And actually, quite a few of you have mentioned to me this week that Jonah lives pretty close to your home. Last week, the prodigal prophet, Act 1, <clears throat> Jonah, it's really a story of two cities, isn't it? Tarshish, running away from God's will, Nineveh, running into God's will. It's a story about two prophets from Galilee, Jonah, who was running, and Jesus, who was rescuing. Last week, it was a story about running and rescuing. This week, we're going to dive into Acts 2 and 3. I see them as a story about sinking and saving. Jonah was sinking and hit rock bottom, which is when he began to look up. And Jesus was saving. He saved Jonah, and he used Jonah to save a whole city. It's a great, unforgettable, gripping story, I think, about sinking and saving. So let's dive in to the sinking part of this story, Act 2, Chapter 2. <clears throat> From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, 
In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of death, I cried to the Lord, and he listened to my cry. You, Lord, hurl me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled around me. The breakers and the waves swept over me. I said, I have been banished. I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again to your temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep whoa, surrounded me. The seaweed wrapped itself around my head. The roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the love God has for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And then God commanded the fish to vomit Jonah out onto dry land. Let's pray together. O living God, take these living words of life. Make them life for us. Today, we pray through your son, Jesus. Amen. Jonah is a story about sinking. The prodigal prophet was tossed into a raging sea, and he is sinking down, down. He's doomed, right? Wrong. A rescuing God sends a big fish who swims in and swallows him up, but he's going down, down again into the belly of the fish. Doomed, right? Jonah thinks so. (laughs) Imagine, if you can, his accommodations in the belly of the fish. Ooey, gooey, hairy, scary. And remember that Jews are landlubbers. Oh, a few of those fishermen paddled around on the Sea of Galilee, but for the most part, they outsourced all their seagoing trade to the Phoenicians and others. The Jews wrote songs about the sea, songs full of sea monsters. (laughs) Levinthians, they called them. And now Jonah is in one of them. The Jews' worst nightmare was coming true for Jonah. He writes about it graphically, horrifically. Verse 2, from deep in the realm of the dead. Now, Dr. Estelle points out that the literal Hebrew there is, in the belly of hell was Jonah. In Sheol, which Brian says is the place of divine punishment a curse that Jews wished upon their enemies. It is the realm of darkness and chaos, of utter despair and anguish. It's where Jonah expected the Ninevites to end up, right? And that's where he was, in the belly of hell. And it gets worse. (laughs) Verse 3 He says, you, Lord, you hurled me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the currents are swirling around me, and the waves and the breakers are sweeping over me. Then in verse 6, he says, I am engulfed, I am surrounded, and the seaweed is wrapping itself around my neck. Can you picture this? This poor guy is terrified, and it gets worse. (laughs) Verse 4, he says, Lord, I have been banished from your sight. Verse 6, the pit I am in has barred me forever. Jonah felt he'd blown it so bad that his plight was irretrievable. He was doomed. There was no escape. He was helpless. He was hopeless. He was terrified. Jonah had hit rock bottom. And sometimes it's at rock bottom that a turnaround can begin with rock bottom repentance. Our friends in the AA 12-step movement 
have shown the light on this fact that often you can't help people who are sinking until they get where? Rock bottom. Sometimes you can't really deal with your own demons until you end up where? Rock bottom. Because it's rock bottom sometimes is the only place, the only time when you what? Look up. What was this rock bottom like for Jonah? This is where Dr. Estelle, I can't get used to calling him that. <laughs> this is where Dr. Estelle, I love it though. <clears throat> this is where Professor Estelle helps us as a, as a scholar, a historian. He makes note of the Hebrew wording and the Hebrew literary forms that take place right here at chapter 2 the beginning of chapter 2. It changes from chapter 1, which is prose, to chapter 2, which is poetry. From chapter 1, which is storytelling, to chapter 2, which is song singing. Chapter 2 is really a psalm. The whole mood changes. Brian says it's like a pause has been put on the whole Jonah story. A pregnant, powerful pause in the storyline. What was Jonah doing during these three days and three nights? Well, we hear the song. I timed it. It takes about a minute and a half to sing. So what was he doing for the rest of those three days and three nights? This is what Professor Estelle has to say. God put his life on pause. We often live at a hectic velocity. This fast pace, many times marked by our own secret Rebellion means we have no time for stillness of soul. No time for solitude to examine who we really are and what we have done or have not done. Stillness of soul. That's what God arranged for Jonah at the rock bottom. Three days and three nights of solitude, silence for reflection and rock bottom repentance. You know, you don't have to wait till you get to the rock bottom to have these moments of quiet reflection. One of my favorite seminary professors, Glenn Barker, who was greatly admired, very popular in school, probably because he had a great personality, warm, loving. One day in class, I figured out why he was such a great guy. He told us that every day, at the end of the day, before he goes to bed, he goes into his home office, and he sits in the chair in front of his desk. And he imagines Jesus in the chair behind the desk. And they talk about his day. What he said, what he did, what he didn't do, and what he didn't say, how he felt, and what he did about it. They talk. And Dr. Barker said Jesus would oftentimes, you know, pat him on the back, way to go, Glenn. And sometimes he would hear from Jesus a rebuke. Glenn, we've got to work on that tomorrow. Every day, there was a pause in this great man's life. A pause to reflect and repent and look anew at life. No wonder he was such a popular professor. Taking time to pause. Jonah had that perforce. God arranged it for him, courtesy of a big fish. Three days and three nights of rock-bottom repentance. Jonah had a chance to get honest about himself and his life, and was therefore able to take the next step in his sinking, which was, I call, open-hearted, open-hearted petition, from repentance to petition. In the depths, at the bottom, bottom, what did Jonah do? Finally, he looked up. In fact, in these nine verses of this song, I count nine references to Jonah's looking up and crying out to the Lord. Look at verse 4. I will look again to your temple. Verse 7, I will remember you, O Lord. I think Jonah was a lot like the prodigal son in Jesus' parable. This prodigal son who left his family farm for a far country. And where did he end up? Feeding the pigs. Terrible place for a Jewish boy to be. But it wasn't until he was feeding the pigs that he came to himself. 
And he realized all that he had left on the family farm, all that he had thrown away. And what did he do? He went home to his father. Oh, father, I have thrown so much away. Please take me back. Help. The prodigal son turned into a repentant son. And so the prodigal prophet turns into a repentant prophet. <clears throat> Three times this Hebrew verb comes through where he called out, or even the better translation, he cried out. He cried out to the Lord. This verb is used frequently in the Bible. All over the Psalms, the psalm singers of Israel are crying out to the Lord. It's a verb of intensity, of urgency, of desperation. It's not polite Presbyterian, please. It is desperate, urgent help. It's the cry that Jesus uttered in the Garden of the Gethsemane. It's the cry that he uttered on the cross. I have learned the power of crying out to the Lord from one of our super saints here at Salon Beach Press, my friend, Dr. Jim Friend. Jim has taught me the power of crying out to the Lord. Away with Presbyterian propriety. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes you just got to let it out to the Lord. Cry out even with volume, Dr. Friend tells me, to cry out to the Lord. Because that's when you can finally realize and admit that you're at the end of yourself and you need help. Crying out to the Lord. It releases the power of honesty. It releases pent-up anxiety. And it releases a great power of faith. Crying out to the Lord. Jonah took two steps in his open-hearted petitions. Step one, look at verse 8, would you please? Look at verse 8. Those who cling to what? Worthless idols. Forfeit what? The love that God has for them. Worthless idols. Do you know what history's favorite idol is? Me. <laughs> we build altars to me, to our accomplishments, our abilities to fix things, me and others. Monuments to me. The most popular idol of all is me. What does Jonah, what did he realize? Those who cling to those worthless idols, what will happen to them? They forfeit the love God has for them. Down, away with these worthless idols of me. Tear down the monuments to my plans, my opinions, my pleasures. They're worthless. The first step, getting rid of idols. The second step, a gutsy admission. Look at verse 9. Jonah says it. Salvation is from where? From whom? From me? I can do it myself? Salvation is from what? My education? My health? My wealth? My friends? What does Jonah say? Salvation is from what? The Lord. Salvation is from the Lord. We can't save ourselves when we're sinking. We can't save others when they're sinking. What did Jonah finally realize at rock bottom? Salvation is from whom? The Lord. Only God saves. And there's only one God, and I'm not he. And neither are you. Salvation is from whom? The Lord. Sometimes it's not till we're sinking, till we get to rock bottom, that we're willing to look up and cry out and admit that salvation is from the Lord. Jonah is not just a story about sinking. It's also a glorious story about saving. So let's read it. <clears throat> Chapter 3, Act 3. <clears throat> Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Go to the great city Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give to you. Jonah, get this folks, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. 
Now, Nineveh is a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth, burlap. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with burlap, and sat down where? In the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. It's a great story about saving. Jonah got saved, didn't he? It's kind of gross. (laughs) What does it say in Chapter 2, verse 9, or 10. God commanded the fish, and it what? Ooh, vomited him out. Picture that for just a moment. <laughs> Got him on dry land. Ugh. But at least he's on dry land, terra firma. No doubt Jonah said, Phew, I'm glad that's over. Now I can get back to my normal life. I imagine God said, Not so fast, buster. <laughs> you were busted for a reason. <laughs> You're not going back to your old ways, your old attitudes, your old prejudices. There's a new normal up ahead for you. You're saved, Jonah, for a reason. And that reason is bigger and larger than the fish and bigger and larger than you. You're saved for a mission. Now go forward into it. I love verse 3, I mean chapter 3, verse 1. Look at it. There's a phrase in there that just grabs me. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Don't you love that? A second time. Jonah, the prodigal prophet, turned repentant prophet, gets a do-over. The love of God brings to us a chance to back up and try again. You blew it, Jonah. Okay, don't wallow in that swamp of self-pity or self-hatred. Get up and move on. Don't languish in the pit of blaming yourself or blaming others. Get up and move on. There's a second chance. There's a new beginning. And that new beginning usually starts with a word from the Lord. The word of the Lord came, what, a second time to Jonah? And what was the word? Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach the message to it that I will give to you. God's salvation for us usually leads us to bring salvation to others, blessed to be a blessing for others. Head to to Nineveh, God said to Jonah. There's more to your salvation than just getting you back to dry land. I've got a mission for you to bring salvation to others. Wow. So Jonah got saved. But it wasn't just for him to hoard. (laughs) Because he had a part to play in God's doing what? Getting Nineveh saved. Nineveh? Go to Nineveh? No, 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 please, Lord. Remember the Ninevites? We talked about them last week. They were not nice people. In fact, in the British Museum, I've been there a couple of times, there's a whole room devoted to artifacts from Assyria during this time. These artifacts picture in graphic detail the conquering victory tactics of the Assyrian kings. And when they would 
have victory over a group. I don't even want to talk about what they did. So grisly, horrifying. They made Adolf Hitler look like an amateur in their torture tactics. Yet God said to Nineveh, Nineveh, to Jonah, go to that great city, Nineveh. Great city. It's an evil, wicked city. Great city. Three times in the 48 verses of Jonah, God calls Nineveh a great city. I don't think he's referring to the size of Nineveh or the power of Nineveh. Nineveh. I really think God was trying to get Jonah to look at Nineveh differently. To look at Nineveh differently. You see, God could see beneath, beyond Nineveh's evil, wicked exterior, and he could see potential among the people of Nineveh. He could see that their hearts were, in fact, open to change. The historians help us here come to find out that during the lifetime of Jonah, there were two horrible plagues that hit Assyria and a total eclipse of the sun that just freaked them out. And they were looking up, open to change. You know, friends, you never know what God is doing behind the scenes in someone you have written off. You never know what ways and means God is using to touch and open hearts that seem closed to you. You never know what the God who sees potential in every human being has in store, even for those you think are beyond the pale. The Apostle Paul had eyes to see. When he urged his Corinthian friends in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, we no longer look at people from a human point of view because if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old passes away. Behold, the new comes. Paul could see the potential. And so could a Brazilian friend of mine named Marcio. About eight years or so ago, we, I was a part of a team from our church that went to Brazil to a partner we've had there for 12 years, the South American Theological Seminary. Keith and Connie Cortman were on that team. SATS is a phenomenal institution, training place, that trains the next generation of Christian leaders in Brazil not only to get the gospel but to get courage and guts to take the gospel to places that have yet to come into the most unlikely, untoward, unpleasant places. We were blown away by going with some of these SATS students. We went with one, a retired guy, who with his meager government income decided he'd go to seminary. And while he was at South American Theological Seminary, he had a vision of God's grace coming to a flavela, a slum, outside of Londrina, the city of a half million people where the seminary was. And this flavella was full of little kids, dirty little kids, wandering around with nothing to do. And this man had a vision to build a school on his retirement income and a whole lot of faith. And we went there and were blown away by room after room full of lively, bright, talented, potential-laden children and great, loving teachers, a retired guy with a vision. Well, kids are my thing. I felt very much at home there. But then they said, wouldn't you like to go out on the streets with Marcio? They invited Keith and me to go out on the streets with, into the inner city of Londrina because Marcio at seminary had been given a vision for, by God to reach the prostitutes, the transvestites, and the drug addicts. Woo! That's way outside of my comfort zone. I didn't even know what a transvestite is or was, <laughs> let alone meeting them. Whoa. So, well, I was going to go with Keith, and he's a big guy and a doctor, so I figured he could fix anything that goes wrong. So we were told to wait for Mario at, at uh, the end of the day in the seminary parking lot. Well, I had my little, you know, butterflies in my tummy. And then my tummy turned to lead and sank to the pavement when Mario and his friend drove up in motorcycles. <laughs> I have never ridden a motorcycle. <laughs> my mother would not let my brothers and me even talk about motorcycles. They're death traps, she'd say. And here come Mario and his friend driving up in motorcycles to take us to the inner city at dark. And I turn to Keith and I say, Keith, 
I've never ridden a motorcycle before. My mother wouldn't let me ride them. <laughs> and Keith turns to me with a wry smile. He said, Tom, your mother is dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so remember that, Keith? <laughs> and, so, and so I gulp, and I put on my helmet, and I climb on the back of Marcio's motorcycle, and off we go into the dark of night into the inner city of Londrina. He parks the, they park the motorcycles, and we get off. We start walking the streets. He comes to a corner with some prostitutes and transvestites, all caked in makeup and very seductive clothes. And they welcome him, open arms, Mario, Mario, and they, he dresses them by name, and they hug, and then we sit down on the corner. He has little jugs of hot coffee, and he pours some for them. And you know what he was doing that evening? He was inviting each and every one of them to his what? Remember, Keith? His wedding. The first people he invited to his upcoming wedding were not his seminary friends, but his street friends. Why? Because Mario could see beneath those hard, makeup-encrusted exterior, he could see the potential of life and wholeness that God had placed in every single one of those street people. And he was reaching out to them with the love of Jesus. Wow. I'll never forget that. We've sent teams back subsequent to that. And they've come back with amazing reports about Marcio. That this ministry vision God has given him has turned into a halfway house, a rehabilitation center, home Bible studies for these friends of his from the street. Because he believes he can see deeper than what I could see. That there's potential to unleash by the grace of God. And it was so, not only for these street walkers in Londrina, but it was so for the Ninevites. Did you catch this great story? That Jesus saves, not just the prophet Jonah, but he saved these Ninevites. Seriously, he did. What did the story say? From the greatest to the least of them, they put on sackcloth, and the king himself stepped down from his high horse, off with his royal robes, and down in the dust he went and issued a proclamation that we should not eat, even our animals shouldn't eat, hoping, hoping that the compassion in Jonah's message might be true for us, and destruction would pass us by. And it was compassion operated, and the destruction passed. And a whole city full of terrorists was redeemed and renewed and changed. Dear friends, do you believe, do you believe that people can change? Hard-crusted people can change when they come into the contact with the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Jonah found it out, but he had to get to rock bottom first because that's when in sinking he was saved. This great story, I love it, don't you? It's a story about sinking, it's a story about saving, and really it's a story about the Savior himself because Jonah points to Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 12 that one greater than Jonah is here with you and I am he. Jonah and Jesus have a lot in common. They were both prophets from Galilee. They both were given a terrifying assignment from God. They both found themselves in the belly of hell, Jonah because of his own sins, Jesus because of our sins. They cried out to the Lord, and he delivered them from that horror, and through them salvation came to others. They have a lot in common, Jonah and Jesus. But unlike Jonah, Jesus died and rose again and lives today and is ready to save. He is ready to save. Jesus goes deep. He looks beneath our failures and our faults, and he sees enormous potential in each and every one of us. No matter how low we've gone and sunk, Jesus will meet us right there. He goes deep, and he goes far. No matter how far away from God we've wandered, no matter how far away from home we've drifted, 
No matter far, far we've gone, Jesus is there waiting for us to save, to restore, to give a second chance, a new beginning. Jesus is there to save. If only we do three things. And these things, these three things I would offer, in fact, urge upon you this morning. One, if we look in and get honest about ourselves. Dear friend, is your life headed in the wrong direction? Look in. And then look up. And declare with all your heart that salvation comes from not yourself, not your wealth, not your education or your status or your accomplishments or your friends. Salvation comes from what? From whom? From the Lord. Jesus Christ, who has power to save you, no matter where you are. Look in, look up, and then open up. Jesus, our glorious Savior, is here this morning, and he's calling to you. Come home. He is waiting patiently for you to come home to him where you belong where the true you, your real potential, can be unleashed with a new start, a new beginning. Jesus is calling to you. What are you going to say? Open up and say yes. Don't say maybe. Don't say later. Say yes today to the one who calls out to you. Dear friend, if you're here today and you're sinking, there is a Savior who's waiting. And you can say yes to him in a very simple prayer, which I want to lead us in right now. Would you, everybody please close your eyes, bow your heads. And if today you want to respond with a yes to Jesus, simply use this prayer that I'm going to say, phrase by phrase. You repeat these phrases from your own heart, crying out in your heart to the Lord, and he will listen. Pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry I've wandered from home. I'm lost. I'm sorry. I cry out to you. Help. Take me. Take charge of my life. Turn it around. Give me a second chance. And I will follow you. Thank you.